just at this point, looking at properties of integrals, and we'll save that for later. Um, properties of integrals here. Some of these things are going to be kind of intuitively obvious when you think about it. Maybe not the first one. The first one maybe you need to think about a little bit more here, but <clears throat> if you have some kind of a function f of x and it represents whatever, right? I mean, we've been using the velocity thing. If that function represents velocity, and if you say you look at the area from 2 to 5 or something like that, the area from 2 to 5, I mean, it's an area, but if you if you look at it this way, or if you look at it this way, it's going to represent different things. I know that if this is time, it's going to be hard to think of what that means going this way. If you look at the area from 2 up to 5, if that represents um, some kind of positive area, let's say that this was 10 here. Then if you do the area from, so this is 2 up to 5 here. If you do the area from 5 to 2, it, like in our situation, that means going back in time, which maybe is hard to fathom, but if you gained, if you had a net change in distance of 10 going forwards from 2 to 5, then going from 5 to 2, you're going to have a net change of negative 10, right? So integral from from B to A, if you go backwards, is negative the integral if you go forwards here, right? So if the area under there is put in 2 to 5. Now, I, in case you don't believe me, this is just this uh, GeoGebra software. And move it up so you can see down at the bottom there. If you put in a function, you want to put the integral of that function. This software is free, incidentally, if you ever want something else to do this. G of X, um, let's go from 2 to 5. Okay, so there's that area. If I go back now and I go 5 to 2 and change this around, okay, it doesn't say error, it just says now it's negative. Okay, and there's nothing on the diagram that shows you that you're going backwards versus forwards, but that is a velocity function. You go from two seconds to five seconds, you gain, you know, 11.36 of distance. If you go back in time, then you would lose that, right? Second one here maybe is a little more obvious. Let's move some of that. If you go from, you know, a number to a, another number, the same number, those numbers are the same. You have some function here from A to A. If this is A, there's no area, right? There's no change in the variable, so how can there be any net gain, right? That's good. Times a function. If you know something about transformations, if you have uh, if you have an area that's let's try to draw this here. Again, some kind of a function like that. We have some area here. See how well I can shade it in. I don't know if I can shade it in all that well, but. Now, if you have, if that's f of x, and then you're going to change it to, say, 2 f of x, if I'm going to put a 2 in front of that, what's going to happen with this function here? You can illustrate this. What happens to this? Twice as tall, right? Now my area didn't work out, but you notice how all the heights change proportionally, right? So it doesn't just mean shifting it up, it means expanding it. So if you make that twice as tall, how much does the area change? Twice as much, right? So if you have the integral of a constant times a function, you can just, the same as you did with derivatives, you can just say it's that constant times the, times the integral. All right? If you, know that, if you know the area of the original function was uh, this, right? You know that area. It's just a constant times that area. The second thing here is just a special case of that. <clears throat> if you have a function that's above the axis and you know that area, Let's say this is 7, this is f of x. If you graph uh, negative f of x, that's not really drawn very well, but try one more time. That's not even, it's worse. Third time, and that's it. There's, uh, there's that area below that's going to be negative 7 if you reflect it, if this is negative f of x. Some indifference one here, this fourth one. If you have a function that is two other functions added together, you may not have done tons of work with that adding two functions. Let's say you have x squared plus 2x. <clears throat> if you want to know the area underneath that function combined there, 
you can get it from the individual two pieces. If you know this piece and you know this piece, right? You can get those two things separately. The two separate areas are going to add up to the the area by itself. So if we look at that on this other graph here, let's go back to this. Uh, let's get rid of that one first. So there's three different, these are sort of just random functions of some sort. Uh, maybe let's move this one down here a bit. <clears throat> okay, so there's, in blue is f of x, in red is g of x. And this one up here is the two of them added together, f of x plus g of x. The y values here are just the sum of the other two y values. Right? So as the red one starts to plummet, like the blue one kind of stays this repetitive pattern here, but the, as the red one starts to go down, well, the, the black one goes down as well. Okay? And as soon as they are equal here, or sorry, as, as soon as the, the blue one's there, uh, red one is zero, well, the black one crosses there. And as soon as these are opposite, the black one goes into, the, into, into here. But if you have the area underneath that curve, and the area underneath that curve, the area underneath this this one is going to be those two added together. Okay, that's all that's saying. You take the two smaller ones and add them together, you get the bigger one. So, not that. Let's turn this one off for a second. If I take all this blue area and pile it on top, you're going to get this filled in piece here that gets filled in in gray there. Okay? That's what that fourth property is all about. If you imagine the rectangles, um, you know how we're estimating area with rectangles? If you imagine having to approximate that with rectangles, let's take a screenshot here. <clears throat> Might work. So if you imagine some rectangles here, if you're estimating the area blue one here, there's that rectangle. If you imagine the area under the red one, there's a rectangle there. Well. That's not a very well-drawn rectangle. But if you drew rectangles all the way across, you can take this purple one and stack it right on top, right? That's that area of that one, okay? Adding the two functions together, it's the same as adding all the rectangles together, stacking them one on top of the other, right? So it makes sense that the area underneath the combined curve is going to be the same as the sum of the other two, right? The other two uh, properties on the pages after that, and the page after that. This one, if you draw a picture of it, some of you drew some uh, pretty nice pictures for this, but if you have a function that has a minimum and a maximum value, then you know for sure you can figure out what the minimum and maximum of this integral are. So if you have, again, just draw some kind of a function here like that. There's the max. Here's the minimum. And you have to, without even knowing anything about the function, the minimum has to be, well, let's do this in blue. Even if you don't know what the function looks like, so this is what this is saying here. If you don't know what the function looks like, but you know that's the min and that's the max, the lowest the integral could be is this. It could be this, right? Whatever that is times whatever interval it is. So let's say you're going from, let's put some points in here. So you're going from here's A and here's B. Right, the lowest that integral could be is this, that area, right? Because the function could be this all the way across, right? It could be the minimum all the way across. Probably not, but it could be. And the maximum it could be is, is this, right? All this, all the way up to there. So again, that's all that's saying. It's saying something that seems intuitively obvious. I guess I should have got rid of the green one first, but all the way up to there, right? Because the function could be like this. I guess my blue highlighting is a bit too high, but right? It's you know it might go like this, but the highest and lowest it could be are those two values. So that's all that's saying is the width of the interval, the width of the interval times the minimum is the minimum value of the integral, or the width of the interval times that maximum. And the last one here. <coughs> I like this word, <laughs> domination. If one function dominates the other the entire time, if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, then its integral is going to be greater than the other integral. Again, if you draw a picture, it seems intuitively obvious, right? Um, if you go back to that other thing, you can draw a picture, but we'll go back to here. Uh, 
turn this one off for a sec. We don't need that sum or the area under that. Oh, but it's not there. Come on. Okay, these, uh, if you have those two functions, if for this interval here, A to B, the red one's always higher than the blue one, it's integral no matter where you stop. You know, if, if this function, now this is not true because eventually it goes below, but in this first part here, so let's just pretend we're not looking at uh, that. We'll make this bigger so it's always above, right? So g of x is always above f of x here, so it's integral. No matter where I put this, the integral is always, the red one's always bigger than the blue one. Seems intuitively obvious. If the thing, if this curve never goes above, how can its area be more? If those are velocity functions, if one car is going faster than the other car, and the area is the net distance, then it is always going to cover more distance than the slower car, right? I mean, again, intuitively obvious if you think about a situation. Okay, so if you want a picture there, have two functions, and area of one's always lower than the area of the other one, all right? Or if one function's always greater than zero, this is kind of a special case of this, right? Then its integral is always going to be greater than zero. Makes sense. If it's always above the axis, the area is always positive, okay? So there's a couple problems there to do, to work on. These ones are you're given some values of certain things. You don't know what the functions are, but you're given some uh, some values of integrals for different, different intervals. And uh, work these things out using, uh, using those if possible. It's possible that you don't have enough information to figure them out. So that's, uh, that's the understanding you need, all right?